You take out your message notes. The past few weeks we've been uh, in a series about passing the 10 common tests of life. And they're all covered uh, in the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, we have all 10 of these tests. Eight of them are tests that Daniel himself had to go through, one of them his friends goes through, and one of them the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, has to go through, which we're gonna look at today. Now, I've said in each of these sessions that before there is blessing, there is always a testing. Before every blessing, there is always a testing. God wants to see if you can handle what he's about to give you. Greater responsibility, greater blessing, greater success or prosperity or uh, spiritual experiences, uh, greater influence. God wants to know, can you handle what you've already got before he gives you even more? And God tests you with stress before he trusts you with success. We've talked about this uh, every single week. God wants to see if you can handle it. Jesus explained this principle actually in Luke 16. Look up here on the screen. Uh, the, Jesus said this. You must be proven trustworthy in small things before you'll be trusted with greater things. That's before every blessing there's a testing. And if you have not been faithful with what is not your own, Who's gonna trust you to give you your own? Before God trusts you with success, he tests you with stress. Now, so far in this series, we've looked at five tests. Let's put them all up here on the board and see where we've been. We, we looked at first, uh, when your world is shaken up, that means when you, uh, the test of a major change. We, we've looked at uh, when you're pressured to conform, peer pressure is a test in your life. Uh, we've looked at when your beliefs are belittled, and uh, remember we talked to the students particularly about that about at school. We talked about when you're asked to do the impossible, when a boss or somebody in your life says, I need you to do this, you go, I don't have the time or the money to do this. That's a test, when you're asked to do the impossible. And then we looked at uh, when the heat is on, and we talked about the, uh, the young men going through the fiery furnace because they refused to bow down to, to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Now the next five weeks, let me show you where we're going, okay? Here's some of the other tests you're gonna see. We're gonna look at uh, when you need to have a difficult conversation. You probably need to know how to do that. When you have to share a hard truth with somebody you love or uh, is in your life. When you need to have a difficult conversation. Then the next one, when people work against you, at work, at school, or somewhere else like that, you maybe even feel like they're plotting against you. We're gonna look at that test. When your situation looks hopeless, we're going to look at, that as a test in life. God often allows things to get so bad, it looks hopeless. And then when the answer to your prayer is delayed, that's one everybody needs. You need to know the skill of how to handle a delayed answer to prayer. That is a test. This is a test. Uh, but this weekend, we're going to look at this, this one, when God tests you with success. You say, wait a minute. I know stress is a test. I, I know suffering is a test. But success is a test? Of course it's a test. Have you ever seen success ruin anybody? Oh, of course you have. It goes to their head, uh, they, they, get, they get stuck up, they, they, they get, uh, you know, uh, it changes their character, they, they crack up, they can't handle it. Um, success has ruined a lot of people. In fact, VH1 built an entire channel uh, of uh, biographies of rock groups that cracked up, messed up, broke up, once they got successful. Success is as much of a test in your life as, as suffering is. In fact, I will tell you as a pastor, and having worked with people now for over 40 years, more people are ruined by success than they are ruined by uh, suffering. You might not think it, but, but when you're in suffering, you go straight to God. But when you're successful, you forget God. And for every, uh, uh, you know, one, nine people who can handle pain, uh, you can't find one person who can handle fame. And the praise goes to their head. The Bible talks about this. On the screen, Proverbs 27, 21 says this. A hot furnace tests silver and gold, but people are tested, read this with me aloud, by the praise they receive. Well, did you know that every time you're complimented, this is a test? I, I, I tell pastors, compliments and criticisms are kind of like chewing gum. You chew on it a little while, but you never swallow it. Because both of them can, can really mess you up. 
He says, people are tested by the praise they receive. Human beings are the only animal that God created that when you pat them on the back, their head swells. <laughs> so we want to talk about the danger of pride and arrogance and ego when you're successful because it's easy to forget God. This is just as much a test as all the tough times you go through. And it's one that we often don't uh, understand. But Daniel chapter 4 tells us how King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that we've been looking at for several weeks now, literally lost everything because of his pride, his arrogance, and his ego. Now let's just review. Nebuchadnezzar is the most successful man on planet Earth at this time, 2,500 years ago. Uh, his father had been the king of Babylon. Uh, he was a young general in his dad's army, and he single-handedly defeated the Assyrian Empire which was the most powerful empire of its day, and now all of a sudden the Babylonian Empire is bigger than the Assyrian Empire because of this young man. He comes home the conquering general, and he is a rock star. And at a very early age, he's very, very successful. And when his dad dies, he succeeds his dad, he becomes the emperor of Babylon. Then he expands the Babylonian Empire until it becomes the most powerful empire in the world of that day. Everybody feared Nebuchadnezzar. And then not only that, he built the most beautiful city in the world. In that day, it's called Babylon. Um, and he built what were called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon for his wife, which were called one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, just like um, the pyramids. I mean, it was of that quality. People wanted to just go to Babylon to see the thing that he had built. And as I said, he became the most powerful man on earth. But Nebuchadnezzar had a problem, and it was his pride. It was his ego. He had, a, you know, some people have a problem with anger their entire lives. He had a problem with pride, with arrogance his entire life because he had one success after another. Now, this story, chapter four, picks up when he's in his 50s. So uh, he, he's already well into his uh, leadership as the emperor. He's a very powerful man. And one night he has a very disturbing dream. Now, this is 32 years after that previous dream that we looked at that he couldn't interpret. Uh, which he called in a guy named Daniel to, to interpret. And, uh, and so 32 years later, he calls Daniel back and goes, hey man, I, I got another weird dream. Can you tell me what it means? And uh, Daniel tells him, he's, he's sad to be the bearer of bad news, but he says, well, king, what this means is this, the dream you've just had. It means that God is fed up with your arrogance. He's fed up with your pride, uh, with your ego. Uh, you would have nothing if it weren't for God. Everything that you've got in life is because God allowed you to have it. And if, you, if God didn't want you to have it, you might be homeless on the street. But you've taken all the credit for yourself. And you should have known better, Nebuchadnezzar, because God's shown you a bunch of miracles since the Jews have been here. Remember the one where, you know, uh, by the way, he built this 90-foot statue to himself. Remember we talked about that? And that's an ego problem. When you say, hey, I'm going to build a 90-foot statue, and every time they blow the horns, you bow down and worship me. He thought he was God. And, and, and then how God saved the three young men, the Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and said, uh, you, you went through the fire. And, and he said, you saw that miracle. And, and, and you proclaimed at the end of that. There's only one true God, and you made this public declaration that God is God and not you, but then you forgot it, and you didn't follow up on that public commitment. And, and for the last 30 years, you haven't served God. You've been serving yourself. And so your time is, is about up because God gave you all of these chances. And because you haven't humbled yourself and you haven't depended on God, God is going to remove you as the king of the greatest empire in the world for a season of time. And he says, not only are you going to lose your kingdom, sir, you're going to lose your mind. You're going to actually lose touch with reality. You're going to go insane. So much so that you're going to be kicked out of the, uh, the, the palace. You're going to go live in the desert like an animal. You're going to, your, your hair is going to get all matted because nobody's going to care for you. Your fingernails are going to grow out so long they look like claws. And he said, you're going to live like an animal. Because you, you truly will actually lose your sanity uh, for a period of time. Daniel then says, but 
Here's the good news, gang. You can avoid it all. You, you don't have to go through this humiliating experience if you will humble yourself. And, and if you will uh, listen to God and uh, if, if you'll just start honoring God with your success. Get this phrase. If you'll start honoring God with your success, you can avoid the fall. Now, unfortunately, the king did nothing about this. He had the dream, he gets the interpretation, and he immediately forgets it. And he goes on his way, still living the ego trip, still being it's all about himself. He procrastinates doing the right thing. He does nothing to humble himself, and he forgets the whole incident. And so he lost everything he had worked for. The most powerful man, influential man in the world, ended up being homeless and insane out on the streets, out, out in the desert. But Daniel says, if you'll start on honoring God, you, you can do, you, you'll avoid it all. But he didn't. So he fails the test of success. Now, let me just say this to you. You can be expected to be tested in your success. Whatever level of success you have in life, God will test you. If you pass the test, you get more. If you don't, you get less. Jesus said it, it's taught all the way through scripture. I don't want this to happen to you. So what I want us to do this weekend is look at this story, 2,500 years old. You can read about it in archeology, span this happened. Um, and I wanna just simply ask three questions. Uh, number one, what gets people into trouble when they start succeeding in life? Because I see successful people falling by the wayside all the time, financially, relationally, mentally, socially, spiritually. What, what, what gets us trapped and what, what causes us to get into trouble when we succeed? Number two, I want to ask, what are the steps to recovery after you've failed? Because what, Neum, uh, what Nebuchadnezzar did, you need to do too if this ever happens to you. And number three, what are the things that I need to remember about God that will stabilize me whether I'm going through success or through suffering. And Nebuchadnezzar learns four things and you need to learn them, you need to memorize them so that whether you're in good times or bad times, these things will stabilize your life. We get into trouble because number one, we get comfortable and complacent with success. We get comfortable and complacent. Now, uh, this happens to all of us. When things are going good, uh, you, you just get complacent. Daniel chapter 4, verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity in my kingdom and palace. And I was taking it easy without a care in the world. Does that sound like somebody who's praying every day? No. Let me ask you a personal question. Do you pray more in pain or pleasure? Oh, there's no doubt when you do. You pay, pray more when you're in pain. When you're in pain, oh God, I need your help right now. When things are going great, hey, let's go to the beach. You're not even thinking about God when things are going good in your life. And, and so it's pleasure that, that pulls us away. It's the good times when pride creeps in that we forget God. I want you to notice all the personal pronouns in this next statement of Nebuchadnezzar. He said, I said to myself, just look. Now, notice the eyes and the me and the mys. I said to myself, okay, you ever talk to yourself? Oh, you do it all the time. I said to myself, just look at this great city of Babylon that I have created. I, by my own mighty power, have built this beautiful city for my glory. I built it to show my power, my might, my majesty, and my glory. Wow, that's quite humble, isn't it? This is the problem right here. Remember the lesson of the whale. When you get to the top and you're ready to blow, that's when they harpoon you. <laughs> Be humble or you will stumble. Nehemiah needed to go read chapter one of, uh, of Purpose Driven Life. The first line, it's not about you. No, it's all about God. He thought it's all about himself. Now, throughout the Bible, we're warned constantly about the dangers of pride. The middle letter of pride is what? I. The middle letter of sin is what? I. Pride causes sin. Pride is the root of all sin. And no matter what the sin is, so I know God says don't gossip, but I think I know better than God, so I will gossip. 
I, I know I'm supposed to forgive that person, but I know better. So I, pride is the renewed. I know what God says about sex, but I'm going to do my thing. I know what God says about money, but I'm going to do my thing. I know what God says about... Pride is the root of every other sin. Pride is the sin that got Satan kicked out of heaven. God hates pride more than anything else in life. Because it says, I'm God, and I don't need God. The Bible says, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Nebuchadnezzar had a major fall in his life. Look at this verse on the screen. Proverbs 50, 16, verse 5. The Lord despises pride. That means he hates it. You can be sure that the proud will be punished. There are many, many verses in the Bible. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace is the power you need to change. If you need to change something in your life, you need to be humble. God resists the proud. That means whenever I'm prideful, I'm on the opposite side of God. And my arms are too short to box with God. He's going to win every time. God hates pride. But we get comfortable and complacent with success. Second thing is we don't pay attention to the warning signs. Now often in your own life, when things are going good, you don't see the warning signs. But in every success are the seeds of your own destruction. But often the signs are not seen because pride blinds us. I, you know, I teach pastors, and I tell pastors all the time, always being in the spotlight blinds you. And that's true in any area of life. Right now in this stage, there are, you know, I don't know, several hundred thousand watts sitting on me. It's kind of blinding. If you're in the spotlight all of the time, you can't see clearly. And so it's not good for your soul. That's why I tell pastors, you need to go home and mow your own lawn and change the diapers and do some laundry and wash the dishes and do the stuff that real people do. And, and, and do everything like, you just need to keep in touch with, with your roots. We, we, we don't pay attention to the warning signs. Now, God clearly warned Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't just remove him from office. God cared enough about this king to warn him. He gives him a dream. He brings Daniel to interpret the dream. Daniel says, this is going to happen, and you can avoid it. You can avoid this massive fall in your career, this embarrassing experience. If you'll just humble yourself, honor God, stop forgetting God, do, do the right thing. And so God said, I, I'm going to warn you in advance. You're about to lose your kingdom, and you're about to lose your sanity. Question, what are the warning signs in your life? When you're headed in the wrong direction. Do you even know what they are? Do you know that what the warning signs are in your life? That you're kind of gotten off track? That you're getting a little prideful? That you're forgetting God? Do you even know what those signs are? Conflict could be a warning sign. If you're having conflict in a relationship, that's a sign you're on the wrong track. Chaos in your life can be a warning sign. Confusion. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. That's a warning sign. You're not as well connected to God as you ought to be. You're, you're doing it on your own power. Like if it's to be, it's up to me. Temptation can be a warning sign. I'm just being tempted uh, at, at work, uh, at school, with someone or something. That's a, that's a warning sign. And God warned Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to lose it all, buddy. You're very successful. You're the most powerful, influential, successful guy in the world. But you're going to lose it all uh, if you don't change quickly. And Daniel tells the king that he needs to do two things. Now pay attention to this. Verse 27. Here's what you do to avoid the humiliating experience. Two things. Repent of your sins and start doing right. Then, number two, begin to show merciful kindness to the poor and oppressed. Then God will allow you to keep prospering. If you want to maintain your success, you need to do these two things. First, he says, repent. Now, we've talked about this word. It just means change your mind, change your attitude, change your thinking. The word repent in Greek is metanoia. Meta means change. Noia means your mind, to change your mind. I used to think this way about my life. Now I think this way about my life. That's what repent means. You just change your attitude. You got some stinking thinking in your mind. You got to check up from the neck up and you need to go, oh, that's, that's the wrong thing. I've been thinking this is all about me. It's not. It's all about God. And the Bible says repent, change your mind. Why? Because humility is a choice. 
Let me say that again. Humility is a choice. It's something you choose to do to yourself. Did you know that never in the Bible are you told to pray, God humble me? Not once in scripture are you ever told by God to pray, God humble me, God keep me humble. It doesn't say that. It says humble yourself. It says multiple times, humble yourself. Humility is a choice. Now let's just define these two words, pride and humility. Pride is when I accept the credit for things that God and other people did through me and for me. When I accept the credit that doesn't really belong to me, I couldn't have done it without God, I couldn't have done it without other people, but I'm acting like it all came because of my brilliance. Pride is accepting credit for things that God and others did through you and for you. Humility, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. A lot of people think humility means I walk around going, oh, oh, I'm no good, I'm nothing, I'm worthless, I'm just a pile of junk. You're not a pile of junk. Jesus didn't die for junk. You are infinitely valuable to God. Look at the cross. It shows how much you're valuable. Jesus died for you. That's how valuable you are. But you're also deeply flawed and broken, and, and you have weaknesses and mistakes and sins in your life. Both are true. You're deeply flawed, and you're deeply loved. Both of them are true. And in pride... Our humility is just having a realistic estimate of yourself. And, and, and it's not putting yourself down. It's thinking about others. It's getting the focus off you. Here's the difference. If I walk into a room where they're having a party and I say, hey, how do I look? I'm thinking, how do I look? That's pride. If I walk into a room, fill a party filled with people, and I say, who needs my help? That's humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. I'll say it again. It's thinking of yourself less. The humble person isn't going around going, oh, I'm so humble, I'm so humble. The humble person is so busy thinking about other people and thinking about God, they're not even thinking about themselves. Does that make sense? Humility is other person-centered. It's God-centered. And the more you think about and care about others and care about God, the more humble you will be. And so he says, you need to repent, and you need to humble yourself. That's a choice. God, you don't want God to humble you, because if you don't humble yourself, God will humiliate you. And there are plenty of ways to do that. You don't want that to happen. And it's a whole lot easier to humble yourself than to have somebody else have to do it in your life. And then he says, the second thing you're going to do, he says, if you do this, you can avoid the big fall, is he says, serve the poor. Serve the poor. Why in the world would God tell the most powerful man in the world to serve the poor? Well, there are many, many reasons for this. First, it gets the focus off yourself. You're thinking about people who have more needs than you do when you are succeeding. Second, um, it, uh, it keeps you in touch with reality. You know, in America, uh, we don't realize how blessed we are. We live in a bubble. Let me just put this in perspective. If you have any coins in your pocket right now, any, or any coins in, in a little you know, dish at home, or you got some in your purse, you are already wealthier than over 90% of the people in the world. You just even have a thing called money that, that's just laying around. If you have a refrigerator with food in it, you're wealthier than 50% of the world. See, mo most people would love to be poor in America. Even, everybody is rich in America. Everybody. Even the poorest of the poor in America are rich. Because we have safety nets here to take care of people. Even the poor have a television or have a phone and things like that. Things, they have clothes. They have a roof over their head. Most of the world would love to be poor in America. And that's why you live in a bubble until like you go on a peace trip and you see how the rest of the world really does live. And when you serve the poor, it keeps you in touch with reality. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons you should volunteer uh, in the peace plan. To, you know, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. You know, the things that we do in peace plan. And you need to volunteer personally, you need to volunteer locally, you need to volunteer to go on a peace trip. It's a, if the more successful you are, the more you need to stay in touch with the poor. That's what the Bible says. Uh, uh, let me just show you some other biblical reasons. We'll put them up here on the screen. You might write these verses down because they're not in your outline. Uh, Proverbs 14, 21. You want to be happy? Well, the Bible says this. If you want to be happy, be kind to the poor. 
It is a sin to despise anyone. You're walking down the street, you see a homeless person, they're sitting there hoping for a buck or something, and you just ignore them. It's a sin to despise anybody. If you want to be happy, be kind to the poor. Look at this next verse, Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever mistreats the poor insults their maker. God considers it a personal affront when you diss a homeless person. Whoever mistreats the poor, let me go back to that one. Whoever mistreats the poor insults their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. That's how you honor God. God says you honor me when you honor the people I, I made. Proverbs 21, 13. Those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. You want God to take care of your need? Well, are you taking care of anybody else's need? This is what happens in small groups. When you care for other people in your small group and their need, they'll be there for you in your need. You're going to reap what you sow. If you don't ever help anybody, are you doing anything totally unselfish to help other people who couldn't possibly help you back? God says that's like banking goodwill in, in the bank of heaven. Let me show you another one. You want to be a leader? Proverbs 29, 14. Love this in the message paraphrase. Leadership gains authority and respect when the voiceless poor are treated fairly. You want to be a leader in the community, leader at work, leader on a sports team, leader at school. Leadership and authority and respect comes when, when the voiceless poor are treated fairly. You know, uh, most of you know this story that uh, 14 years ago when I wrote the book Purpose Driven Life, it became a huge global success. Far more than I could have ever imagined. It was the best-selling book in the world for many years, like four or five years. It was number one in the New York Times for over three years. It's the most translated book in the world except for the Bible. It's in 137 languages. And when that book became the best-selling nonfiction hardback in American history, it brought in tons and tons of money to me. And it also brought in tons of tons of influence. And all of a sudden, I'm getting calls from people like Bill Gates and Jack Welch and the President of the United States and the head of the UN, and I'm getting asked to speak at Davos World Economic Forum and TED and the UN and Congress. And I'm going, wait a minute, I'm just a pastor. I, you know, the whole reason, this is probably the only large church in America this size, not on TV. And it's intentional because I didn't want to be a celebrity. I, I didn't want our church to be turned into a studio. I, I, love, I love you and I love our, our church and I didn't want it to be the, this famous person. But the book kind of ruined that. <laughs> you know? And... and all, you know, all of a sudden, enormous amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars start coming in, and all of a sudden, enormous amount of, of, of notoriety or, or fame. And I, you know, when you write a book and the first sentence of the book is, it's not about you, then you know the money is not for you, and the fame is not for you. So I'm going to go, okay, Lord, what am I, I obviously I know this money is not for me, what, what do you want to do with it? I'll just give it away, but how do you want it to be given away? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a pretty simple guy. If I got a pair of jeans and a good t-shirt, I'm happy. You know, I, I don't need a lot of bling. And so uh, I began to pray through Scripture, and God gave me two passages of Scripture. One from the New Testament on what to do with the money, and one from the Old Testament on what to do with the, um, the fame, the notoriety. In, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this. Uh, those who teach the gospel should make a living by the gospel. In other words, it's okay to pay your pastor. It's okay to pay a missionary, a priest. It's okay to pay, pay people who serve God full time. That's fine. But Paul says, but I will not accept that right. I have the right to, to be paid for what I do. But I will not accept that right because I want to serve the gospel for free. So I'm a slave to no man. And when I read that, I thought, that's what I want to do. And so Kay and I made five decisions on what to do with, with the money. All of a sudden, unexpected success. What are we going to do with this success? Money and fame. What are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to use it to serve the poor. We're going to use it to help other people. And so we made five decisions. First, we said, we're not going to spend the money on us. I still live in the same house I've lived in 25 years. I drive a 16-year-old Ford truck. I bought my watch at Walmart. Actually, this one was given to me. It keeps the same time as your Rolex. 
doesn't go any faster or any slower, okay? You know, I paid 15 bucks for it, okay? I, I don't need a whole lot of, of, of things because I don't need things to prove my worth. So I said, I'm not, we're not going to change our lifestyle one bit. Second, I stopped taking a salary from the church in 2002. Third, I added up all the church had paid me in the previous 22 years. Many of you know this, and I gave it all back. So I've now served this church free for 36 years. I'm a volunteer pastor, okay? So no, nobody pays me to do this, okay? So those of you who volunteer in this church, well, welcome to the club. I'm a volunteer pastor, okay? In fact, I'm a full-time volunteer, and when some of you re retire, I expect you to volunteer full-time, okay? Uh, because I'm a volunteer pastor. You know, this is the difference between a professional and amateur. A professional is paid to, to do good. Uh, those of us who are amateurs, we're good for nothing. <laughs> Actually, the word amateur comes from the word amore. You know what that is, the word love. And an amateur does it out of love. The professional does it to be paid for it. I am not a professional pastor. I'm an amateur pastor. I do it because I love you and because I love Jesus. Nobody pays me to do this. And then we set up a foundation called Acts of Mercy to help the vulnerable and the poor and people with AIDS and, and children and widows and orphans and all kinds of things like that. And then the last thing, most of you know, Kay and I became reverse tithers. Now, we'd been raising our tithe every year. We got married 41 years ago. When we got married, we paid, gave 10% to the Lord. The next year, we gave 11. The next year, we gave 12. The third year of marriage, we raised at 3%. And every year, we raised our, our tithe, giving to, away because I just wanted my heart to grow bigger every year. Every time I give, it breaks the grip of materialism in my life. Every time I give, my heart grows bigger. Every time I give, I become more like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. And so on years that it was very tight financially and the cupboards were bare, we would still raise our giving like a quarter of a percent. And on years I'd get a raise or we'd have a windfall or something and we'd raise it four or five percent. Most of you know that today Kay and I give away 91% and live on nine. And I've played this game with God for now, you know, 41 years. God says, you give to me and I'll give to you and we'll see who wins. And I've lost that for 41 years. I dare you to try that one. That was actually the easy part. What do you do with all that money? Just give it away. And it's been so much fun just giving it away. So we did. We just gave it all away. Uh, the second thing, though, was what do you do with the fame, the attention? This is the thing that you get when you, the more successful you become. And I was reading for that, and I came upon Psalm 72. Psalm 72 is a prayer by Solomon, the son of David, who was the king of Israel. At that time, he's the most powerful man in the world in Israel. He is the, the, the king of this, the United Kingdom, its apex of power. He's the wisest man in the world, and he's the wealthiest man in the world. And in Psalm 72, it's his prayer for more influence. When you read this prayer, it sounds so self-centered. Because in this prayer, Psalm 72, Solomon says this. Uh, God, I want you to make me more successful than I already am. I want you to make me famous. I want you to spread the fame of my name to every nation. I want everybody to know who I am. I want you to give me more influence, more power, more visibility. And it sounds totally self-centered until you read the motivation. And then he says, so that, here's the motivation, so that the king may support the widow and orphan. The king may release the oppressed. The king may help the poor. That the king may care for the sick. That the king may you know, help those who are in prison and, and oppressed. That the king may be the defender of the immigrant and the foreigner. Today, he, he's mentioning all the people of marginalized in society. And he's saying, you know, today he'd say, so that I can help the, the mentally ill and, and, the, and, the, and the handicapped and the aged and the elderly and all the people that we want to push off to the side of society. And in that passage, I remember tears were coming down my face as I read that passage. God said to me, the purpose of influence is to speak up for those who have no influence. God did not give you success so you can be a fat cat and prideful and buy an island and, you know, have drinks with little umbrellas in them. God gives you success not for your benefit. 
but for the benefit of others. And when you understand that, God will give you more. And if you're faithful in little, then you'll be faithful in much. Now, I know some people hear that story and say, well, yeah, Rick, if God gave me millions of dollars, I'd give millions away too. No, you wouldn't, because you're not doing it now. I had a track record of being generous when I didn't have the money. I had a 36-year track record on that. And the fact is, you know why God made that, let me be the author of the best-selling book in American history? He knew what I'd do with the money. He knew he could trust me with the money, that I wasn't going to use it on me. And that the first sentence would be, it's not about you. One of the verses that God showed me when I was having to go, because it scared me to death. I said, I know what success does to people. A lot of money, a lot of fame can ruin you very quickly. And one of the verses God gave me, this verse on the screen, Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are perishing. By the way, that would include the unborn because they can't speak for themselves and they are certainly perishing. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are perishing. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. So, we are to repent, change our attitude, and we are to serve the poor. This is the warning that God gives to Nebuchadnezzar. He totally ignores it. And so the third thing that happens, right down the third problem, is we put off doing what we know is right. And this is the third reason that Nebuchadnezzar fell, and it's going to be the third reason that you might fall in your success if you don't hear the warning. We put off doing what we know is right. We procrastinate, we postpone, we delay, we defer, we dawdle. Daniel 4 verse 28 says this. <clears throat> After he had had this dream interpreted, 12 months later, oh, wait a minute, 12 minutes later, what's he been doing for the last year? God says, you're going to lose your kingdom and you're going to lose your mind if you don't change. Well, what did he do? What in the world is he doing? He's dawdling, procrastinating, delaying, deferring, ignoring, forgetting, not, not changing anything in his life. Now, let me ask you this. If God warned you, if God tonight warns you in a dream, you're going to lose everything you've ever worked for in your life if you don't change. Would you wait 12 months? Let me ask you that. It, personally, if God warned you, the truth is, he has warned you. It's right here in this book. And he says, if you'll do these things, I'm going to bless you and you're going to succeed in life. If you don't do these things, you're going to fail. You're going to hit the wall. You're going to have dead ends, delays, difficulties, and things are not going to go the way you want them to go. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. So we put off doing what we know is right. He knew what to do. And it says here, 12 months later, because he hadn't done anything, all of what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed did actually happen to him. He lost it all. He's taken a walk on a flat roof of his royal palace in Babylon. And um, as he took, looked out across the city, and I'm sure it was quite magnificent, the skyline, he boasted to himself. He's talking to himself. I'm sure he's going, man, Nebi, you know, he calls himself Nebi. <laughs> Nebi, you are the man. You are the dude. You are number one. You, 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 I mean, everybody wants to be you. You know, got to be good looking. He's so hard to see. He said, you are the man. And as the words were still on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what God declares to you, decrees to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your power is being taken away. You're no longer the ruler of this kingdom. You're going to be deposed from the palace, ostracized by everyone, forced to live with the wild animals, and immediately it all happened. He lost his kingdom and he lost his mind. He literally went insane. History confirms this, that there was a period of time. Now, we don't actually know how long he was in this loss, where he lost his mind, lost his kingdom. Because the Bible says you're going to lose it for seven periods. And some scholars think that means seven seasons, which would have been a little bit less than two years. And some people think it means seven years. 
which would have been a long time, but it wasn't like a month or two. He has a major CEO burnout. And it's public, and it's embarrassing. And the guy who was the most powerful man in the world is now drooling on himself and acting like an animal in the desert and can't even make sense. That's humbling. That's humiliating. He's out of touch with reality, becomes a fool, he's unreasonable, he acts like an animal. By the way, you haven't ever seen it like this, but have you ever seen a friend who all of a sudden decides to not do what God wants them to do and they walk off a cliff and do something self-destructive and you're going, what in the world? Have you lost your mind? You go, wait a minute. You, tell me, you're going to leave your wife and kids for her? Or have you lost your mind? Wait a minute. You're going to leave your husband and you're going to break up your marriage for that guy? Have you lost your mind? People do this all the time. Self-destructive behavior because they're running from God. And so his life just collapses in a very public and humiliating way. And we see it all the time. In fact, the news loves to cover this kind of stuff. But God has mercy on Nebuchadnezzar. And after this period of humiliation, whether it's two and a half years or a couple years or seven years, we don't know, uh, he restored his mind. And I want you to see now the steps that Nehemiah took back to sanity. This is the road to recovery. And he did three things. When you have a major failure in your life, you need to do these exact three things. He looked up, he woke up, and he spoke up. Let's look at the first. Number one, write this down. Three steps to recovery after failure. First, look up to God. Look up to God. And the Bible says in Daniel 4, verse 34, uh, at this time, after this time had passed, you know, when he had lost his, his mind, I, Nebuchadnezzar, he's given the testimony. This chapter is his testimony. I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned. Literally, it, it says in the Hebrew, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Do you need to do that today? Some of you have never taken this first step. You're in a heap of trouble right now. You're in a mess. You're in a mess in your life. It's going the wrong way. But you're looking to everything else and everybody else to solve it. You're looking to other people. You're looking to the government. You're looking to yourself. You expect your husband or your wife to solve it. Whatever. You're in a mess. You need to look up to God. You need to get your eyes on heaven. Re refocus on God. Not be looking at anything and everybody else. And by the way, sometimes God has to lay you flat on your back to get you to look up. I hope he doesn't have to do that to you. Just do this now. Look up to God. The second thing he did is he woke up. Here's the second step. Wake up to God's greatness and start worshiping. Wake up to God's greatness. Not your own greatness, but God's greatness. And start worshiping him. Worship just means focus on God. When you focus on God's greatness, that's called worship. You wake up to God's greatness and you start worshiping. You get your focus off yourself, off your problem, off your humiliation, and you get your focus back on God. How do you do that? You start worshiping again. If in the past you used to read your Bible a little bit every day or try to pray every day and read the Bible, that's called a quiet time, you need to do that with regularity. You need to develop that habit and start focusing, worshiping on God every day. If you've been inconsistent in your small group or you haven't been in a small group for a while, you need to get in a small group again. You need to start going every week and be consistent, worshiping God. You see, in good times, you start backing off, go, hey, I don't need to go to church this week. I'll go once a month. That's cool. You know, now that we got money, let's buy a boat or a cabin or a condo or uh, an RV, and we'll spend three weeks playing, and once a month, we'll go to church. Really? Is there anything more important in your life than worshiping God and hearing from him on a regular basis? If you know something that will help your life more than going to worship God, stand up and tell us right now, because I'll go do it with you, because I'm not going to waste my life. Just tell us. No, getting in touch with God every week in worship. You need, you know, when the doors are open at a church, I'm going to be there. Why? 
Because I've often wondered, what if that was the week God wanted to speak to me that was going to turn the direction of my life, build the career that I never even imagined? And if I didn't go that week, I missed it. I missed it. I don't want to miss what God says to me. Some of you need to make a recommitment to be at worship every single week. Not like once a month or every two weeks or whenever. I'm gonna, I do, it's more important for me to hear from God than to hear from television or hear from anything else going on in life. So I wake up to God's greatness and I start worshiping again. And I'm there and I worship God all the time. Verse 34. Nebuchadnezzar says, my sanity returned and I praised and worshiped the most high, that's God, and I honored the one who lives forever. This is the second step to recovery. My sanity returned when I started praising and worshiping and you know, being grateful for the things God has done in my life. Now I want you to write this down. I don't know what bad thing you're going through right now, but I will tell you this, we get better we get better when we replace pride with praise. We get better in any area of our lives when we replace pride in ourselves with praise to God. Now let me say it again. Every time things are going good in your life, this is as much a test as the bad times, as the delays, the difficulties, and the suffering and the pain. Every time things are going good in your life, God's gonna go, are they going to become prideful or are they going to become praiseful? Are they going to just think, hey, look how cool we are, I am, or look how cool God is. He, I would not have any of this if it weren't for God. You know, about a thousand years before this event, and this happened about 2,500 years ago, a thousand years before this event, Moses said the same thing to the Jews who were coming out of 400 years slavery in Egypt. God had promised for Generations, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to take you out of slavery from Egypt, and I'm going to give you a land of your own. It's called the promised land, and it's a cool place. And they spent 40 years walking across the desert where God tests them many times. And Moses is actually more afraid of the success in the promised land than he is of the slavery in Egypt. He's much more worried. He says, I'm afraid you guys are going to stop depending on God when things are going good, when you're in the gravy years of your life. And so he says this, he gives this warning before they go into the promised land. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2. Remember how God led you through the wilderness these past 40 years. He's talking to the Jews who have been slave, enslaved and then freed. He humbled you, while you're out there in the wilderness, by letting you go hungry. You know, sometimes God humbles you by letting you go hungry. You're hungry for a relationship you don't have. You're hungry for a need or a job or something that you don't have. And God lets you go hungry in order to humble you. He said he humbled you and he said he tested you uh, with hardships many times. We're all familiar with that. To test your character and to see if you will obey whatever he commands you to do. Will you obey God when things aren't going good? Now, he says, here comes the other test, the test of success. Now, God is bringing you into a good land. This is the promised land. A land with plenty of water. You're going to have all you want. With bountiful crops. With orchards full of fruit. With abundant copper and iron in the ground. So you can build your tools, make your tools. Um, and you will lack nothing. Your bank account will be big enough. You're not worried about paying your bills anymore. So, he says, when you're full and you're satisfied, and you're prospering, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with gratitude for all he has given you. The attitude of gratitude is the first line of defense against falling into ego and arrogance. The more grateful you are, the more humble you will be. The more prideful you are, the less grateful you are. So he says, praise God. And remember, you got, you got two choices when things are going good in your life. Praise God or be proud of myself. He says, when you're full and satisfied, be, be grateful to God. But, he says, be careful. This is a warning. Danger, Will Robinson. Warning that you do not forget the Lord. And that you continue always to obey every command of God. It's so easy to forget God when things are going good. 
Otherwise, when you have built your fine houses <clears throat> and your gold and silver have multiplied, in other words, you got money in the bank, your stock portfolio is doing good, your heart will become proud. Here's praise and pride contrasted. And you will forget that it was God who saved and delivered you out of your slavery and gave all this to you. Have you forgotten that? And when you become successful, do not think, I did this all by my own strength. And I became rich by my own power. You know? Look how cool I am. I'm entrepreneur of the year. Instead, remember that it is God, your Lord, who gives you the ability and strength to produce wealth. Those guys, those of you who are entrepreneurs, you need to write that verse down and put it in your car and on your desk and in your mirror, that it is God who gives you the ability and strength to produce wealth. That is a gift from God. That is a gift from God, and you need to thank him for it. He says, I warn you, if you ever forget God and you begin turning things into idols that you worship, I turn my car into an idol, and I, worship, I turn my boat into, I turn my career, I, I turn things that we've created into uh, uh, idols instead of worshiping the creator of everything. He says, I warn you, if you ever forget God and begin turning things into idols that you worship, God will destroy it all and your nation. Just as he has destroyed other nations before you who forgot God. I don't know another verse on the Bible that is needed by America than that verse right now. Our nation has forgotten God. Let's just remember, this nation was founded by believers, Christians, who came to America, they were called pilgrims, to start a new country, a new land, where they could worship God freely. They came for religious reasons. They were called pilgrims. They're the pilgrim fathers of this church. And for 300 years, the Bible was taught in every single classroom in America for 300 years. It's only been taken out of uh, uh, schools about the past 75 years. And we've forgotten God. And I, I shudder to think what could happen to, to our nation, to our country. And what is he saying here? Success is dangerous. He's saying, be careful. There is a danger when you experience the blessing of God. You see, let me just put this in perspective for you. Your greatest test in life not may be when you lose your job, but when you get a new job. And all of a sudden you're so involved in it, you forget God and church and worship and service and ministry and all these other things. Your greatest spiritual test in life may not be when you go into debt, but when you get a raise. And you go out and you buy some stuff to keep you from thinking about God because you're so busy, you know, out. I say, look, we're this weekend, we're not going to church, we're going to do recreation. We're going to wreck creation. <laughs> at the lake, at the beach, at the river, we're going to go wreck creation. <laughs> and so you get a raise. Let me just tell you, here's what you do. When God blesses your life, you welcome it. Thank you, God, for this blessing. You celebrate God's blessing in your life. You celebrate the successes. But then you get on your knees and you humble yourself and say, God, I realize I wouldn't have any of this if it weren't for you. I could have been born in Sudan or Biafra, Pakistan, Myanmar. I could be a homeless kid on the street somewhere. I didn't choose when and where I was born. I didn't choose my natural giftedness. I didn't choose my talents. I didn't choose the freedoms that I have to excel. It all comes from you, God. And you humble yourself. Now, while, ne while Nebuchadnezzar is going through this recovery, he learns four things about God. He wants to tell the whole world about him. And the next four statements I want you to write down because these are statements that will stabilize your life, whether you're going through success or suffering. Doesn't matter good times or bad times, you need to always remember these four things that God is in control. Write these down. Four things ne uh, Nebuchadnezzar says about God that he learned in his fall. Number one, God's kingdom will outlast everything I do. God's kingdom will outlast everything I do. So if you want to make a lasting impact with your life, 
bet on the kingdom of God. Your career is not going to last. But the kingdom of God is going to last forever. Verse 34, God's rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. That's why Jesus said, seek first, make your number one priority, the kingdom of God and all this other stuff that you need. The passion, the pleasure, the position, all the stuff you need, it'll be taken care of. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. So make your number one priority something that's going to last. Not my career, not my reputation, but God's kingdom. Build your life on God's kingdom. It's far more important than your career. God didn't put you here just for your career. So he says, I learned God's kingdom is going to outlast everything I do. Second thing he learned was this. God's approval matters more than all the others. Everybody else may disapprove of me, but if God approves of me, it doesn't really matter. You only need one person's approval, God's. If God likes you and you like you, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You don't need other people's approval to be happy. You just need God's approval. In verse 35, he says, all the people on the earth are nothing compared to him. Who do you want, when you die, who do you want saying good job? The people around you or God? You made your life count. Who do you want saying that? God or just a bunch of people? Third thing he learned, God's power is absolute. Which means he's big enough for any problem you're going to face in your success. Verse 35 and 37. Nebuchadnezzar says this. He, God, has the power to do whatever he pleases. He can do it among the angels of heaven. And he can do it with those who live on earth. Okay, His power is absolute. No one can stop him or challenge him or even question what he does. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And Nebuchadnezzar would have said, and I'm exhibit A. Okay, I was the most prideful man on the planet, and God humbled me. Now look at verse, the next verse, verse 36. Or, or, yeah, 36. It said, when God restored my sanity, he also gave me back my honor and kingdom. This is true. This is what happened. And all my leaders returned to me. And my kingdom became greater than ever. So if you've had a big fall, it's not over. It's not over till you're dead. He said, I, all my leaders returned to me. My kingdom became greater than ever. So now I praise and I exalt and I glorify. That's called worship. The king of heaven. That's God. He says, I'm a king, but he's the king of heaven. Because everything he does, God does, is always right. It's always true, and it's always fair. Now that means, here's the fourth thing he learned, write it down. God never makes any mistakes. We do, but he doesn't. We don't understand why everything's happening, but we do. He does. And we don't have to understand. I'm sure the people in Babylon said, wait a minute, we got a leader who went insane for seven years. Well, God's still in control. All these things are saying God is in control. So what does he do? He looks up to God and then he wakes up to his greatness and his, he's in control and he worships God. And then the third thing that the king did, and you need to do this when you're going through a, a failure. He looked up, he woke up, and then he spoke up about his recovery. Tell others how God has saved and changed me. Tell others how God has saved and changed me. Now, I, I love the fact that this is a pretty humiliating experience to be the most important man in the planet, on the planet, and now you're, as I said, out there drooling in the desert, and you can't even put sentences together. He's not shy. He's not embarrassed about his fall. He's not embarrassed about how God restored him. In fact, he tells the entire world. He'll tell anybody who listens. And the Bible says this. King Nebuchadnezzar sent a letter to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. By the way, that letter, it's this chapter. It's, this is his story. This is, this is his story. This, by the way, is Nebuchadnezzar's celebrate recovery story. It's his testimony. If Nebuchadnezzar were here today, he'd stand up and he'd say, Hi, my name is Nebuchadnezzar. I'm a believer who struggles with pride. Do you realize he, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven? 
you're going to meet him there. This Babylonian king is going to be there because he became a believer and a worshiper of the one true God. He's going to be there in heaven. and You can, you can meet him. And he says, I wrote this letter to the leaders of all the world, throughout the na every nation. He said this, may you prosper. That's how he starts his letter. I want to tell you about the wonderful miracles that God has done for me. And then he tells his story to all the leaders of the world through a letter. I'd like getting a letter from the king of the greatest empire telling you his testimony. He told other people. He, he woke up, he, he looked up, he spoke up, and he looked up. And he woke up, and he, and he spoke up. Now, let me ask you a question. Has God done anything for you? Has God saved you from anything? Has he shown his grace to you in any way? Have you been changed by God in any way? Then who are you telling? Are you telling anybody how good God has been to you? Are you telling anybody how good God has been to you? Well, no. Why not? Why have you not told your story to anybody else? Well, you know, it'd be kind of embarrassing to do that. That's called pride. That's your problem. That's the very problem this, that got this guy in trouble. When you are saying, well, I don't want to talk about God with my friends or the people I work with, that's called pride. It's saying, I'm embarrassed to say God has been good to me. I'm embarrassed to talk about how he's changed my life. That's pride. You need to think about that one. Would you pray the prayer of Nebuchadnezzar? Say, God, I don't want to get complacent and comfortable in my life. I want to pay attention to the warning signs. And I want to stop putting off what I know to do is right. I don't want to procrastinate anymore. I want to humble myself before you. I, 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 I first take this step. I look up to God. Some of you, this is the first time you've ever done this. Say, God, for the first time, I'm, I'm looking up to you. I've looked to myself and everybody else for the solution. But I'm saying today, you are God and I'm not. And I'm sorry for the times I've acted like it. You know what's best and I don't. Say, God, I want to wake up to your greatness and I want to start worshiping you. I want to focus on you, not my problems, not my pain, and not even my successes. I, I, want to, I want to replace pride in my life with praise. I want to stop focusing on me and focus on you. I want to recommit myself to being at worship. Nothing's more important than me getting to know you. Because God, your kingdom's going to outlast everything I do. I want my impact to last and what you're doing is far more lasting than my own career or anything else. And God, forgive me for worrying about the approval of other people. Help me to remember I don't need their approval to be happy. That your approval is all that really matters. Help me to remember that your power is the absolute, that you are in control. That history is your story. And you're bigger than any problem I'm going to face. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you because, God, I believe you never make any mistakes. You're always true, just, loving, and right. And then, Lord, help me to tell other people. Forgive me for my, my shyness, my cowardice, my embarrassment. Lord, if, if I'm truly humble, I'm going to tell other people all the good you've done for me. Help me to tell others how you've saved me and you, you've changed me. If you've never invited Jesus Christ to be the Lord, the manager, the CEO of your life, say, God, I open my life to you today. Jesus Christ, you become the manager of my life. And I want your plan and purpose for me, not the one that I've been trying to go on. And I humbly 
ask you to help me to live with an attitude of gratitude, realizing that everything comes from you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com slash locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.